So we had a, I'm going to talk about aliens. Uh, but before I do that, uh, we had a little bit of interesting news today um, that's kindred relevant, and I wanted to share it with you because I'm pretty proud of it. Um, so we, um, Kindred was named to a list of the MIT's uh, smartest 50 companies. And this is a very prestigious list. It's very hard to make it. But the thing that was distressing about it is that they have this map that they show of where all these companies are from. And there wasn't a single company on the list that was from Canada. Not a single one which was a little surprising, of course, because we're from Vancouver. But it, they, th they thought that we were from San Francisco because we have an office there, but we're not. We're from here. Uh, th three years ago, the previous company that I founded, D-Wave, also made the list. And it was also the only company from Canada that was on the list at that time. So um, there, I've been trying to build the tech community in Vancouver for 25 years, and I find it super depressing that it seems to be so hard to generate world-changing zero to one companies around here. You know, I think that I'm gonna, I'm gonna just pitch this idea. Some of you may have seen me talk about this before, but we have this problem here that we don't think big enough. We've got all of the ingredients to create this massive, massive thing in Vancouver, uh, and the spark is not being lit. So I implore you, if you're entrepreneurs, people who are thinking about what you want to do, think bigger, because we don't think big enough around here. Okay, so my previous company was D-Wave. I'll just uh, show you a couple things. We built what are still the world's only quantum computers that you can buy. And the company, D-Wave, has been doing this. Thanks. I didn't really have much to do with it, but you know, like, so this is one of them. Um, this is one of the processors. And uh, a lot of interesting things happened to me over the years there. I got sent pajamas, uh, a whole bunch of stuff. You know, there's lots of interesting things that happen when you build something like a quantum computer. But just as an aside, because I thought it was funny, one of the interesting things that's happened from the D-Wave story is there's this gigantic uh, conspiracy that's arisen on the internet that goes like this. So D-Wave builds quantum computers. The way that they work, if you know this, how this works, is one of the interpretations is that you tap into these parallel universes and they do computations. Sounds really weird. But uh, what, what, what's happened is this idea has been hijacked to describe something called the Mandela effect, which is this thing where um, the past changes. So think about something you know to be true from the past. And then imagine you went out on the internet and you can't find it at all. It's not there. It doesn't match with your experience. So these people think that D-Wave is responsible and CERN. And of course, the quantum key to the abyss factors into it somehow. I'm not exactly sure how. OK, so that, that's just D-Wave. Uh, I did that for about 15 years. It was a lot of fun. A big science project that we turned into a commercial entity. Uh, that was a warm up for Kindred. So Kindred is much, much, much more ambitious than D-Wave. And what Kindred is trying to do is build real AI. So what you've heard about AI is not what we mean by AI. What we mean by AI is a software system that can do literally anything that a human can do. Literally anything. And obviously, computers are better at things than people in lots of different ways. So now imagine, not only can they do everything that a human can do, but they can do everything that the best human at any task could do better than them. So imagine there was the mental Olympics of the 100 meter dash and Usain Bolt is the fastest person. Now imagine that's some kind of a mental thing like writing a novel or writing whatever. Imagine now that the thing is so much faster than Usain Bolt, like for example, it's a spaceship, yeah? It's, it's still doing the same thing, but it's doing it so much better because we're limited because we're people. So um, what Kindred is trying to do is solve this problem. How do you build machines that are better than people at everything? Now, there's a mental block that we have here when we think about this. Because when you think about that, one of your questions might be, for example, what are the applications of this? So imagine this. Imagine, for $10, let's say, I could build a, a, a machine, like a little robot that had fingers and eyes and all that. And it could do your job better than you, no matter what it is. 
and I could sell that to your employer for, say, $15 and make a profit instead of having to pay you $100,000 a year. Now, imagine that was true for every single job. So that's what we're talking about here, is a complete and utter transformative change that of the likes of which has never been seen before in the history of humanity, making the Industrial Revolution look like a little tiny blip on the path that humans have taken from when we emerged from the ooze a few billion years ago. We are right on the verge of that transition now. So uh, this guy, Rich Sutton, is one of the most famous people in the academic world of AI. And like many, when asked, when will this happen, he says things like this. 25% chance within 13 years of this thing that I'm talking about. You know, when you think about what, is on the, what you read on the news, you know, CNN, BuzzFeed, whatever, they're all kind of the same nowadays. Think about how unimportant that thing is that you're reading if this is true. Yeah? So what does this have to do with aliens? So uh, Sam Harris, who I quite admire, is a very interesting guy, um, was reciting this parable at a TED talk that he was giving, and it goes something like this. So I am, uh, say I'm the President of the United States. So I received this message from the heavens. So my microwave dish, my SETI dish, finally captures something. And what it says is, in 50 years, or 13 years, we're coming to your planet. You got to be ready. Now just imagine what would happen if, it, if that happened. A super intelligent alien race beamed down a message to all of us Earthlings saying, we're coming July 13th, 2030, and boy, you better be ready because the mothership is landing right on the front lawn of the White House or wherever you wanted to land on that day. The amount of resources that would be marshaled to try to figure out what to do would, it would encompass the whole world. AI is just like that. So when this thing that I'm talking about happens, it's going to be exactly the thing that you're thinking about, about those super intelligent AIs. So the one thing I can tell you is they're not going to be like us. So alien means, you know, different. These things that we're building are not going to be people. They might be really smart, they might be really good at all sorts of different things, but they're not going to be like us. They're going to be aliens. And they're going to be, I'm sorry to say, way smarter than every single person in this room in ways that we can't even comprehend. So this, of course, triggers a lot of alarm. One of the guys who talks about this is Elon, who uh, says things like this. Like, when you do this, beware. Because you think, just like the guy in the stories, that when you do this, you're going to put that, that that little guy in a pentagram, and you're going to have your holy water out, and you're going to wave it at the thing, and by God, it's going to do exactly what you say, and not one thing more, but it never works out that way. So uh, this, is an, this is an attitude that some are having, this emerging alarmism about the way this is, is going to go. But this, these words, demons, doesn't capture the essence of what's happening here. Uh, I don't know if any of you are uh, turn of the century weird fiction fans, but there's this guy named H.P. Lovecraft, who's a very famous American weird fiction author. And he exposed a, a view which is called cosmicism. And the essence of cosmicism is cosmic indifference. So he, what he was saying is basically, yes, there are these massively intelligent entities out there, but they're not good, they're not evil. They just don't give a shit about you even in the slightest. The same way that you don't care about an ant is the same way they're not going to care about you. And these things that we're summoning into the world now are not demons, they're not evil, but they're more like the Lovecraftian great old ones. There are entities that are not necessarily going to be aligned with what we want. So this transition is really, really massively important for our entire species to navigate and going back to that thing that Sam Harris was saying, nobody is paying attention. This thing is happening in the background while people bicker about politics and what 
what's going to be in the health care plan in the U.S. And underneath it all is this rising tsunami that, if we're not careful, is going to wipe us all out. So, um, on that uh, pleasant note, uh, we're hiring people <laughs> <laughs> to try to make something like this happen. Uh, and, uh, of course, you know, this is a very uh, difficult project, of course, and I'm, I'm kind of a little bit tongue-in-cheek about all this, like, you know, uh, how, how bad things are, because uh, it's not really like that. You know, there's, technology is a double-edged sword, even something like this. Uh, it's agnostic. It depends who wields it. If you want to have a say in how all this goes down, you can't sit on the sidelines. And one of the ways that you can get involved and really change the world, like, you know, a lot of people say, hey, join the Marines, you'll change the world or whatever. This, is, this thing, this opportunity that I'm talking about here in Vancouver is an opportunity for you to literally change the world. Because the code that you write may be running in the brains of these things in 10 years. So this is a, this is a huge opportunity. I, uh, I, I'm going to ask that anybody here who is a software engineer who's really good, uh, to talk to any one of these three folks who are sat at the back there, who are uh, Suzanne founded Kindred, um, and Olivia and Paula are uh, some of our key folks in Vancouver, or talk to me, and um, uh, we'll have a conversation. Um, by the way, I love Joseph's talk, it's true. Uh, startup life can be very, very difficult, and uh, you will fail many, many, many times before you succeed, uh, just as a matter of course. Thanks. Thank you, Jordy. First question over here. Uh, hi, Jordy. My name is Nerwin, and I do really want to talk to you after this. <laughs> so, you know, you were talking about summoning the demon by Elon Musk, right? Um, and there are a lot of other pioneers in this industry, such as uh, Andrew N.J., who was a former chief scientist at Baidu. Uh, when he was asked the same question about summoning a demon, he said that his analogy was um, it's more like thinking about overpopulation Mars. You know, it was completely opposite. But when there are two pioneers in this industry who have different sets of opinions, how do you think that it's summoning a demon rather than the other way around? Well, uh, obviously people are going to have different opinions. You have to make up your mind yourself. So the, uh, my, my, com my general comment is that people always miss the future. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's this old thing that people are always saying things will go faster than they do in the short term and slower in the long term. That, but it, it's kind of, for me, it's an obvious thing. I mean, this isn't about, uh, the only question is how long it will take. Uh, if you, again, I encourage you to watch that Sam Harris TED talk if you're interested in this. But the point that he makes is that as long as certain things that are probably true hold, this will happen. Will progress continue? Maybe it won't. Maybe the Earth will get hit by a meteor and we'll all die. Uh, if progress continues, things that we're doing, intelligence isn't magical. It's not some kind of weird thing. It's a, it's a mechanical outcome of the way that our machines in our head work. We're going to figure it out eventually. And when we do, we're going to make it better in all sorts of interesting ways. And then you have this weird thing that happens that because the machine is now able to act, in its own self-interest, it can take the action to make its own thought process better. We can't do that. So we're stuck with what we were born with, more or less. We can learn things, but that's not the same as getting smarter. So these machines are going to be able to take control of the tools from which they are built to create better versions of themselves. And that, what's sometimes called an intelligence explosion, is something that biological creatures can't undergo. So I think it's an absolutely guaranteed outcome of progress. The only question is when, and I think Andrew would agree with that. James? Hey, uh, great to have you out here. It was uh, brilliant hearing Thanks. you speak for the first time myself. I'm sure a lot of people here would agree with me. Um, what is your goal to stop the world from turning into that of the Terminator? Uh, right. Um, so I've, uh, you know, I've. Th so there, are, there are things about the world that I can't stand, okay? And I think that's probably true for everybody here. You know, you look at the world, and there's all these things that you think, shit. Why is things? What are things like that? So there's a couple of things you can do um, when you're faced with this. 
the, the one that I've, I've found works for me is I'm like, screw that, I'm gonna do that myself, right? So back, you know, 25 years ago, I was like, this is bullshit, why aren't there any quantum computers? It's not that hard a problem. And so we changed the world by actually building them. And in this case, this is bullshit, why don't we have AI? It's been what, 60 years since Turing? I mean, the, the, it's an absolute catastrophic failure of human resource allocation that we spend enormous amounts of money on things that are of no lasting consequence when the mechanism that generates all human flourishing is not understood. It doesn't make any sense. Every single thing that we will ever do and ever have done comes from this property. So when someday all cancer is cured, when polio was cured, when smallpox was cured, these things all came from people's minds. It's you can continue to do this stupid thing where everybody works on some particular use of the mind. Okay, well, let's go and do X. Let's go to Mars, like Elon says. That doesn't make any sense to me because every single thing that you can think of comes from the same place. You gotta think about what that is. So if you can figure out and bottle this thing that creates flourishing, that creates all of the good things that we think about, you know, we know about the way that we are, that is the key. You know, do that. So, you know, uh, that, that's kind of the way that I think about the world. The world doesn't have the things it needs. And it, you can't just sit by and watch other people do it. So, uh, you know, the, the, it just won't happen otherwise. If I, the way I think about this is if Kindred didn't exist, in 20 years, we're still having this conversation. Because the people who are trying to do AI are going to get sidetracked into making a lot of money, doing all sorts of bullshit that doesn't matter. So what I want to do is make sure that when we do this, we're solving the real problem, and we don't get sidetracked, and we don't go down paths that are going to make us a lot of money just because they're, you know, some short-term thing. We do it because we understand the civilization-changing importance of accomplishing this task. So, you know, the, that's, that's the way I think about things. Things are bullshit. They're not the way they should be. Change it yourself or else it won't get changed. Last question. It's going to go to Dave if no one raises their hand. No, 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 no repeat questions. Oh, okay. It's going to Joseph. Make this good. Pressure's on. Well, I, I don't get the impression you struggle at night. I think you're pretty clear in what you're set out to do. It's incredible uh, passion. Quick question for you. So. Simple mind of mine, I understand AI, what it can do for us 10 years from now, I get excited about it, just share you know, the applications everybody can think of. EQ, do you ever envision AI getting a place where we can actually have emotional intelligence or can, can actually impact, influence, manipulate, or even help on the emotional level? Absolutely, no question. By the way, I really liked your talk. It was really good. Thank you. Um, no, I'm serious. Uh, people don't talk about this enough. You know, it's always like roses and fun, but entrepreneurship isn't about roses and fun. It's about, it's about getting your soul crushed over and over and over again. And the people who succeed are the ones who keep getting up. You know, it's like that Rocky thing, you know? I'm not going to try to do it, but you know what I mean, that's thing. Uh, yeah, so uh, no, my, my view is that you, if, if it's a thing that you can measure, it's a thing you can improve. I think that being good with people, so we were talking uh, with some of our technical people the other day, and one of them said this very funny thing. I'm gonna to try to remember what he said. He said, um, language is a way that we use other people as tools to achieve our goals. So that's really deep, right? So we don't usually think about language that way, but when I say something, I'm trying to use you as a tool to get something I want. So in this case, it's we're hiring software engineers this is the main thing that I'm trying to get. So I'm trying to use you as tools to satisfy this need of mine. Now, it's, it's a little bit weird to think of things that way, but if you're building an AI and you go and you try to figure out what is language for, language is this thing that is a, a way to use the people around you to get what you want, which is almost, it's a little sociopathic when you think of it that way, but it's almost a definition of emotional intelligence, is that if you are so tuned in 
to the responses or the, the, how a person will respond to the message that you provide to them, not only your words, but your language and how you act and what you buy and how, what you wear and all that, that you can always predict that the outcome will be the thing that you want, you're going to be very, very successful. And po say politicians are like this. You know, sometimes you see people and you think these people are just like, man, that guy's got charisma. Like I met Bill Clinton once and he was like, holy shit, I've never seen this before. It's like there's sparks flying off this guy. What was it? You know, he's just got something. And I think that, uh, that that's a thing that you can measure and it's a thing you can improve. And I think that it's going to be a part of AI in the future. Not only this kind of idea of like super rational, but also super good at getting what they want. And that's not a bad thing, right? As long as what they want is something good. Like for example, if the AI is programmed to want to make you happy, say, you might imagine that it will do whatever it can do to achieve that objective, which might mean this sort of thing, you know, giving what you what you really need when you need it. What a beautifully thoughtful question to end the night. Uh, Dave, you're gonna have to bother Jordy. Was good too. I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure it was. <laughs> um, thank you so much, uh, Jordy. Round of applause.